Recording is in progress. Welcome to Wisdom from the Wild, a leadership development lunch and learn. We'll get underway here in about five minutes, so stand by. And while we're standing by, if you're in the webinar, go ahead and try to type into the chat. Let us know where you're tuning in from. What city and state you're watching from. All right, we've got Indiana representing as well as New Hampshire. And as you note on the slide there, we want you to be active in the chat for this lunch and learn because we'll have some opportunities to give away free copies of the book. Welcome everyone. Get underway here in just a little while. What we're doing is uh, typing into the chat, what city and state are you tuning in from? What country are you tuning in from? We want you to be active with questions and responses in the chat because we're gonna have an opportunity to give away a couple of copies of Wisdom from the Wild, Julie's new book. And in order to get a copy of that, we'll need you to participate. So only participants in the chat will have that opportunity to win. Atlanta, Georgia, or nearby Mansfield. Excellent. Love that part of the state. Northport, Austin, Florida, representing Sarasota. That's where I'm speaking to you from. My name is Jason Robert Shaw here behind the scenes about to get our webinar started in just a few minutes. Maine, oh boy, I'm gonna have a chilly weekend I think up there in New Hampshire and Maine. Just talking to a friend up in New York and they're expecting a negative 15 he said this weekend. Mur. Boston, Annapolis, Savannah, excellent. Welcome. So those of you joining us, go ahead and type into the chat. Let us know where you're tuning in from, what city and state or country are you watching from? North Carolina, Sarasota, Silver Springs, Maryland. Excellent. Welcome to Moat Marine Laboratory. Welcome to warm Florida. Currently it's 69 degrees and completely sunny here in our state. If you do get a chance to visit, I hope you can come down to Sarasota and see us. Moat Marine Laboratory and Aquarium, we're open 365 days of the year. So you're always welcome to come check out the wildlife in our own backyard if you come back down here to Florida. Welcome everyone. Just have folks tuning in here. We'll get underway here in just a moment. I got our countdown going, but we'll go ahead and uh, Give it just an extra moment, because I know folks are just getting ready. I hope you have a nice lunch with you. Sorry we couldn't provide that for you as part of the program, but instead you'll get to feast on knowledge. 
two very special guests that will be uh, leading our conversation today, both wildlife experts in their own right. I'll give it another minute here before we get underway. In the meantime, again, we're typing into the chat. Let us know what city and state you're tuning in from. And remember to be active in that chat space because we're going to give away a couple of copies of the book. Mayaka City, wonderful place nearby. We got folks representing from Seattle. That is a great city and state to be in. St. Pete, wonderful. Thank you for joining us today. Bradenton Beach and Toronto, Canada. So we're international, officially international. Wonderful. Folks from Washington, D.C. and Osprey. Excellent. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Moat Marine Laboratory and Aquarium. My name is Jason Robert Shaw, and we're coming to you live for our monthly sea show. Uh, these are some adventures that Moat Marine Laboratory offers every month, and it gives us an opportunity to let you know a little bit about what's happening behind the scenes here at Moat. We have opportunities for K through Gray, and uh, we're glad to bring this opportunity to you today. And I'm also very happy that I've got two of my favorite friends here to join us for this program. Uh, we've got Jim Wharton from the Seattle Aquarium, and of course, we've got our author, uh, Julie Henry. So Jim and Julie, tell us a little bit about what the program is and who you all are. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Jason, and welcome, everybody. Good morning from the West Coast. I'm Jim Wharton from the Seattle Aquarium. My pronouns are he and him. It's so exciting to see everybody piling into the chat and sharing where you're from. What we'd also love for you to share this morning is any wildlife you might be surrounded by, whether that's a bird outside your window, maybe it's a cat in your lap, maybe it's the dog on the couch behind you. Let us know what wildlife might be in your current view. Now, I'm super excited to be here with my good friend, Julie Henry. Julie, it's great to see you. It's great to see you, Jim. Thank you so much for being here with me live. Thank you to Jason for all the hard work behind the scenes that goes into not only today, but the ramp up for today. And I also wanna recognize my friend, John Watkiss, who I know is, is out there in the chat world someplace. And you're gonna see him a little bit later on video. Uh, John is a professional voiceover actor and uh, an all around awesome person, teaches pre presentation skills. And he got to come with me um, out into the wild. We couldn't bring you all. I wish I could bring all of you with me out into the wild, but instead John, John stood in your place. So you'll see some videos here. And then of course, Jim, I've known you for uh, 18, 19, I say almost 20 years. Um, and so you, you, I've always appreciated your work um, for ocean ethic, for uh, diversity, equity, access and inclusion, for empathy for the oceans. And um, just to show everybody from the beginning that this is gonna be an unscripted conversation between us. I don't know what you're uh -oh. going to ask me, um, but I'm going to tell you from the beginning that you were one of the inspirations into one of my unbreakable laws. And oh. I know you don't know that. <laughs> and I wonder if you know what that is. So at the end of the so at the end of the day, if, if I haven't, uh, if we haven't talked about that. I may, I may disclose that to you. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll, well, I'll have to, I'll have to ponder that a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> we, 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 we have known each other for quite a while. And I know that Julie was, was the, the person that brought me into the, the Florida Marine Science Educators Association and the National Marine Educators Association. And of course we've been connected for, for, uh, for so long. And, you know, what Julie is an, you know, uh, a, a, triple threat doesn't quite capture it, like multiple, multiple threat, right? Leadership consultant, educator, uh, marathon runner, mom, and now author of this amazing book. And we were both uh, VPs of education right here at Moat Marine Laboratory. So Julie, what was your favorite Moat memory? Oh, it's so, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure I could pick one. This is, but this is what I'll say. My favorite Moat memory is when I would be sitting at my desk and a scientist would call me and they would say, hey, we just made this great discovery or we just got this shark in from Greenland and we're gonna look at it and study it and we're gonna take pictures of it for a new book. Do you have any kids with you that you wanna bring down? And I'm like, yes. And we would go <laughs> running from wherever we were. It didn't matter what we were doing. The science always took precedent and the discovery and that um, you know, continues to still drive me today. And one of my favorite things about Moat I, that was also some of my favorite uh, memories, just 
being in this place where new knowledge was being created, I mean, we were we were able to share things that were years away from being in textbooks and not even out on the internet. So you came to Moat and you got to learn the cutting edge of what was happening in the ocean. And that was always really exciting. Now I'm, I'm looking at the chat and I'm seeing a ton of wildlife that people are, are surrounded by, birds outside. I saw a terrapin, which is amazing, surrounded by lemurs and a dog. So that's unbelievable. So uh, I, I love that someone just happens to have lemurs nearby. Uh, so lots of incredible things. Now this book, that there's, there's a lot of different ways that you could approach a book on leadership. And there's probably been 150,000 different approaches to books on leadership. So what is it about, why animals? Why are animals the focus of your approach? Yeah, you know, uh, why not, right? It's like, we, we've looked at leadership from every different way, but the thing about animals for me, in addition to the fact that I just love them, I'm, I'm watching the chat too and thinking, gosh, I'd love to see where everybody is right now and be with you. But when you think about leadership through the eyes of wildlife and wild places, it automatically levels the playing field mm -hmm. and it makes you feel like you can sit and think about leadership. You don't feel constrained by, well, maybe I don't have the right degree or I haven't been in my job long enough or, you know, I, I, I haven't gone to the places I need to go yet. No, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how many years you've been on the earth, how many years you've been at the company, what kind of degrees you have or letters behind your name. If you think about what a cat can show you, what, what a mangrove can teach you, it just helps us bring it back to being really accessible and really real because, you know, nature doesn't ask you to be anything other than what you are, but nature also doesn't let you pose, right? Like you cannot start climbing a mountain at two o'clock and expect to have a good day. You've got to start <laughs> early in the day prepared and be ready. And, and nature's going to meet you where you are. And, you know, it's, I think leadership can be seen as a challenge for folks. It can seem daunting and I, you know, nature and animals do feel restorative for people. And so I think that that's, I love that aspect of it, but I think when, when people might think about animals and leadership, I think they might expect to see lions and eagles and <laughs> not necessarily sea cucumbers and <laughs> corals what 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 was what were you thinking in, in including some of these uh sort of less traditionally charismatic fauna yeah you know I think it's really easy and, and no disrespect to elephants and no disrespect <laughs> to eagles because I'm a I'm a big fan of, of y'all as well. But it's easy to look at these animals and think about, oh, it's you know, I'm I'm walking through the, the the hard part or I'm gazing out with my serene, you know, view as eagle. I mean, I get it, it's amazing, but I wanted to highlight animals that people may not even know is an animal, like a coral, um, and that don't get their due, both because I, I want to highlight those animals, but also I have a soft spot, a soft spot in my heart for people that don't always get seem to be, I don't think you're a leader because you don't exhibit these to traditional leadership qualities. So for both of those reasons, I thought, let me just pick some animals people know like sea turtles and then pick some animals that they might not know like sea cucumbers because they can teach us just as much. And I'm far more interested in being surprised and sharing that surprise with something um, innocuous looking like a sea cucumber and getting people to go, you know what, maybe I can ask a question too. I don't have to know everything. I mean, I can totally disclose that um, I was writing this book and I learned that I was wrong about something that I started teaching mangroves 25 years ago. And the science has changed as yeah. it does. And I didn't know until I wrote this book and my lovely friend who's my science editor said, no, this fact is actually different. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. I love to be wrong. So that's what I wanted to share with people, authenticity. Yeah, and that's true about leadership too, right? What we know about leadership changes over time. And, and you're very specific in the book that not everybody ha should be following the you know exact same model for leadership. Mm -hmm. Everybody leads in their own way. Yeah, please don't follow the same model. I mean, it's just going to feel uncomfortable. And yeah, I mean, people ask questions about nature, just like they ask questions about leadership. And that's what it should feel like. It should feel unknown. And the more comfortable you get with that uncomfortability, the better leader you're going to be and the better impact you're going to more impact you're going to make in the world. So I'm looking at the chat and I'm seeing a lot of activity there, which we love. Of course, we are going to be giving away five books today. So uh, stay active in the chat and you'll, you'll have an even better chance of winning one of those copies. 
I love that somebody included their baby as the wildlife they're surrounded <laughs> by. We are all animals. There's no difference. So I think that's fantastic. And uh, I think now it's time for us to take a little walk in the mangroves. Is that right, Julie? Yeah, let's do it. Let's head outside virtually. So John, you're a friend of mine and a fellow speaker and a fellow trainer and just have known me for a long time, but I'm really excited to show you around a place that you don't know much about me. It's part of my past. It's where I started my journey, both as a kid, both as a leader, and I have a present for you. I love presents. <laughs> okay, good. So it's my hot off the presses book. <laughs> this is Wisdom from the Wild, the Nine Unbreakable Laws of Leadership from the Animal Kingdom. And I call them unbreakable laws because I think that there are some grounding truths that no matter where I am in my journey as a leader, I can learn. And so that's why I put it together. Awesome. I love it. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm excited about finding out what's in this book and about finding out what happens in where, where we are today. I'm looking forward to seeing the animals and your past, the part that I don't know yet. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So I, I just got to ask you just off the top of my head, like, you know, just given everything I've just told you and what you know about me, like, what do you think you're going to learn or what are you excited to learn or maybe, you know, share over the water cooler someday with a friend of yours? I'm looking forward to learning about something that I haven't heard before, <laughs> and I'm sure there'll be lots of it. So whatever animals you have to throw at me, not literally, <laughs> <laughs> but to show me and to teach me a few of the lessons, I'm interested in seeing just how those relate to leadership mm. and not just from the standpoint of leading a group of people, maybe even leading myself. Oh, I know this will be different. Yes. Well, good. Thanks. Enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> so. So we're outside. I mean, the most perfect place to talk about leadership, right? And I told you we'd be talking about leadership lessons from animals and we will get there. But to start with, we're going to talk about leadership lessons from trees. Okay. But these trees know how to withstand ways they know how to grow prosperously and they know how to basically create habitat for other animals okay so you're going to share that with me how they do that <laughs> yeah because i talk about three steps of how to deal with change and the first one is the red mangrove tree i'm going to give that leaf to you so this leaf is the red mangrove leaf and it's exactly those things it's waxy and durable because it doesn't want to let the salt water in as oh. it's living this is the first species you know you see look where we are we see the ocean out there and then the first species of tree we see is the red mangrove so this is the leaf and if you look and you can see behind you and, and all around us there are these big what they called walking roots they just stick these roots right out into the ocean the animals around it love it because the little fish can come in here it's a nursery for little animals oh. so very first step of leading change just like this red mangrove is to assess where you are starting from this red mangrove is reaching out it's the very basis of dealing mm. with those waves of change you've got to stop and assess and think about where you are. Then I'm going to give you this next leaf. Okay, now look at that leaf. Ha. Huh. So much lighter in color. Yep. I, I, I don't know if that's lighter or that's lighter, but different in color. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then even the spine is much thicker on the red mangrove. Okay. Okay, if you feel really brave, do you feel like licking the back of that leaf? No. Are you going to tell me that it's yeah. lickable? <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you it's lickable. Okay, see if you taste anything in there. The salt? Yes, yes. So it lets the salt in. Yes. No, okay, so this leaf, they, this tree doesn't let anything in. So you're assessing where you are as a change. But now you're building a plan. This is a black mangrove species. This was a red. This is a black mangrove species. And what they do is they actually let some of that salt in. So just like a leader, you're building a plan like, okay, we're working with the change here but they excrete the salt they it's they don't want to keep that salt in its body it's too much so that's the that's the middle step you're building a plan you're dealing with the change you're excreting the things that you don't want to deal with right you because a plan needs to be finite you need to have goals that you can achieve over a certain amount of time your team needs to be on board and so that's the black mangrove i want you to imagine that i hand you a third leaf and this third leaf is round compared to these two leaves. Okay. And right here at the base of the stem on this third leaf, it would have two nodules, kind of look like Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. And that is the white mangrove tree. And so the white mangrove tree is the last species, but actually my favorite part of the change process, because 
I think, and maybe you've had this experience too, I've been led by people, and I've done it as a leader myself, where, okay, we've, we know where we're going, we've built the plan, and then we just start to do, mm -hmm. because we have to, right? Yeah. Things are rolling, we have to meet these de demands, we have to meet our goals. We forget the crucial step, which is what the white mango reminds us, there's two nodules, because it's commit to action and communicate uh. to the people that are going to be affected by the change. Maybe that means that they are actually the ones doing the change, and maybe that's the ones who are the stakeholders involved. Okay, the white mangrove leaf, uh, these two little nodules actually excrete sugar, and so it attracts all of the little bugs and such to eat it. Oh, okay. So that's my indication that like, look at the way that committing to action is fruitful for the tree and also communicating. And commit sounds really weird. Like, yeah, 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 you've gone through all this. It sounds like you should just be able to do it. But how many times have you said like, yep, I'm totally going to go to the gym tomorrow. And many times, <laughs> many times. <laughs> and then it's tomorrow and you don't go. Um, and you, so you've got to be strategic and intentional about it. And just like communication, you've got to know who you're communicating to, what the message is going to be, who's doing the message in, who the messenger is, and then what you want them to do with all this, how to take action. This shoreline would not be what it is. These animals would not have a habitat here and it would not be able to withstand the hurricanes and the storms that come here. Change keeps coming, weather keeps coming, storms keep coming, and these mangroves are important just like this process is important. So the foundation starts right here with the mangroves. It starts right here. I love that process, Julie. It's it's uh it's clear and it's concrete and it's memorable because it's tied it's tied to a to the mangrove, which is a metaphor, which is great. It's how we learn, right? And uh, you know, it's 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 iterative, which is also really a good thing to remember because change comes in all different sizes, right? There's small changes, big changes. Sometimes we can see the other side, and sometimes like say during a global pandemic or maybe even during a giant capital project, you can't see the other side of change. Uh, and um, and we, I know that we, when we were talking about that and talking about sea turtles, it kept reminding me of that expression, not all who wander are lost. Why were sea turtles your sort of avatar for finding your way through change? Yeah, you know, I appreciate everything you're saying, Jim, because, you know, when I was out there working with you in Seattle, and we were doing a huge eight month project, we yeah. used this three step process, we assess, we build the plan, we built the plan, then we committed to action, we strategically communicated it. And people ask me all the time, how does change actually stick? And how can I get people to trust the process? Well, it's by having a process that has distinct phases and being totally transparent about that. Um, and then you're right, the sea turtle, you know, when we did that big change process, or even if you're doing it on a smaller scale, you're going to get to the point where it just, like you were saying, like you just can't see where you're going anymore. And, you know, personally for me, even in the points of change in my career, I've leaned into animals and learned lessons from animals. I didn't expect, you know, I've never been like, if you ask me what my favorite animal is, wolf, giant squid, you know, sea turtle really wasn't high on the list, <laughs> but when it came to, when, when I was thinking about the change and, and why I was feeling so stressed, honestly, the image and the lesson that was coming to me was from sea turtles because sea turtles, after they lay their nests out here in Florida or wherever they are in the world, you know, they go and they never see the other turtles that they're hatched with, they never see their parents. I mean, talk about being left to fend for your own, my goodness, they are gone. But the most amazing thing about sea turtles, I think, is the fact that that female, wherever she is in the world, she's coming back, um, but she's gotta come back and figure out where she's going. And even when you can't see it, she's led by the purpose to get her where she needs to go. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really amazing because a turtle, a sea turtle, that's an unassuming animal. You know, when you see those animals in the wild swimming around, they look like anything but purposeful, you know, <laughs> big floppy flippers and just sort of look, they, they really do look like they're just sort of aimlessly uh, tooling about, but uh, they have direction and purpose. Yep. Yep. And I think, uh, I think we've got a video here for, for me to show, show you what these sea turtles actually look like and explain more about that. Great. Let's see it. Okay, so people ask me all the time why I connect leadership lessons with animals. And 
in addition to the fact that I just love leaders and I love animals and I think they marry so well together, really, it's that when people ask me as well, what is the definition of leadership? To me, leadership is about leading change. If you're not leading change, what are you doing? And when I look at nature, nature is about change. I mean, think about the last time you went outside or went to the beach or looked at your favorite tree. Like, chances are it was different yeah, than the absolutely. last time. Yeah, everything adapts. Right, right. And like, and when you go outside, like, tell me about a time you, you walk outside. Like, what do you notice or what are you looking for? Or why do you go outside? So the sun and watching sunsets is something I absolutely love. Yeah. Probably one of my favorite activities to do is to go to the beach and just watch it progress. And I could do it every single day because it's different colors every single day. Right. <laughs> and that is the perfect segue because we are standing in the Marine Mammal Building and actually the area where we have some resident reptiles here at Moat and they are the sea turtles. And when that sun sets in the summertime, what happens is a sea turtle will come to shore and lay her eggs, lay her nest on shore. But when she comes up on shore, and so she's, I mean, go with me for a second. She's crawling across the sand. Mm -hmm. She's used to being in the water, so it's a very arduous process. She's literally sifting through the sand. So right there, does that get in your mind about what it's like to go through change? Right, right? yeah. You're like, sift, sometimes it feels like you're crawling through the sand. It's not easy. The reason why I wanted to talk about sea turtles with change is because when those sea turtles grow up, mm -hmm. the female sea turtle, no matter where she's living, is going to find her way back in the ocean without GPS, without mentors teaching her. I mean, leaders, we're always looking to mentors and people to guide us and we should, but there's a point when they can't help us anymore. Yep. We have to go through the change by ourselves, yes. right? That female sea turtle is coming to basically the same area from which she was hatched wow. to lay her nest and continue the cycle. But if you lean into your purpose, that's the whole point of this analogy. If you lean into your purpose, the reason why you started that change in the first place, then that purpose can get you through when it's tough to the finish line. Sea turtle leans into her instinctual ability to follow the magnetic field. The magnetic field is your purpose as a leader. It's her guidepost that's going to lead her back to the, to the beach from which she was hatched. Well, so you just have to dig into your reason and keep going. Yeah, lean into your purpose. And I've, as I've watched leaders do that in, in multiple industries, it's the way that people trust them as well. You know, they trust mm. that their intentions are in the right place because sometimes you're going to make decisions that people are like, I don't know what you're thinking, but okay, we trust you because we see your intentions and your mindset. And I can't see that far ahead because I'm not the leader. I don't know what you're, you're seeing or the conversations you're in. But your team's going to trust you if they know that you're dialed into the reason why you started in the first place. Mm. It's not a short time process. This is mm. patience is part of the process and getting back to your purpose. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, it's, it's all about patience and it's all about recognizing that if you just literally, like a sea turtle, stop and take a breath at times, you can dial back into, yep, I'm where I'm supposed to be. And if it's, if it's the wrong move, I'll make the next decision tomorrow, but I'll keep on that journey. That's great. <laughs> so this is audience participation time. I know Jim was seeding this in the chat, but we really want this to be an applicable lunch and learn for you all. In addition to celebrating wildlife, wild places, and all things leadership, we want to hear from you. What is one change, one change professionally that you want to lead this year? And I'm encouraging you to think about this as a stretch goal, something ideally where you're going to have to get other people involved. But as we hold each other accountable and really think about this, all of the things that you're dealing with as leaders right now, I mean, the world is continuing to evolve as well as it does normally, but also with the current situation as we are all still dealing with that. So what's one change? Put it into the chat. And um, while people are entering, Jim, I'm going to ask you, what is one change you want to uh, lead as in your leadership roles that you have. It's great. You know, I, I, we talked about this yesterday and I've been thinking about it and I just, it's, there's so much that's going on right now, right. That we're, we're all going through, through, whether it's through, you know, I, our, our staff right now has gone through a lot. Um, after two years of pandemic um, staff losses, uh, all kinds of, uh, of pressure. And, and we're, we're bringing a lot of new staff 
onto the team. And so that's, that's where my focus is right now. I mean, we really want to, that, that, that influx of new life into the team is, is a big change moment, right? Mm -hmm. Because uh, people come in with new ideas. They are bringing change into an organization. Uh, Their presence uh, is going to change the folks around them, but they also have to change and, and, and learn as well. So that, that's where my focus is right now. What about you, Julie? What do you, what do you have on the horizon this year? Mm. Yeah, it's a really good question. Well, I am wanting to change and, and lead around how I can help people, um, meeting them where they are and um, engaging them in new ways, because I think that we are hungry and ready to, to learn, to challenge, to grow, and to not just think about good ideas or get too broad too fast. So really, how can I get people into the fold? How can I push them to feel safe but uncomfortable? Um, And how can I continue to remind them to dial into their own personal leadership style and their own personal instinctual gut when it comes to leadership? There's a lot of uh, of great responses in the chat already. Uh, We've got um, Alice is a Marine docent. She's planning new programs and revamping old ones. That's always a challenge. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've got some folks who are leading teachers in new science materials. Uh, so that's, you know, anytime you switch up curriculum, that's a challenge. Animal care plan implementation for the entire Department of Natural Resources division from Kim. That sounds like quite a change process that they'll be leading. You know, all of these are, are there's a ton of fantastic examples in here. Some of them are big, some of them are small, all of them will test us, right? Anytime you go through change, it's it's pressure on yourself, it's pressure on your team, and uh, it requires resilience. And of course, when I think of resilience, I think of sea cucumbers. <laughs> I am so glad to hear you say that because I think about the same thing. Right? <laughs> I mean, really, um, you know, I, when I talk to people about resilience and, and I tell them to channel their inner sea cucumber <laughs> and they're really like, it's not what I really thought you would say. <laughs> Unless you know me well, and then you know that I'm going to talk to you about sea cucumbers. But, you know, here's the thing. Yeah. You know, you're leading this change. You're out in front of it. You're being strategic. Please dial into that strategic muscle. You're leading teams. In order to lead change, you have to lead teams. It doesn't matter if they work for you or they're outside your organization. But then you have to be resilient as a leader. You cannot burn yourself out and then expect everybody else not to do the same thing because you're leading by yeah. example, right? And I want to encourage you that when things feel tough, I mean, how many of us, I can hold my hand up, have gotten to that point in change where you just feel literally sick to your stomach, yeah. right? Something's gone wrong. The market has changed. The, the federal funding didn't come through. Something didn't sell as much as you thought. And you suddenly have to go into a meeting to report to your owners, your board, your team, whoever it is. And you're the leader. You're the one. The buck stops with you, right? Um, and when you think about a sea cucumber, which is really one of the most innocuous animals possible to think about resilience. But this little (laughs) animal that looks like a sausage on the bottom of the seafloor, literally, if an animal were to come over that's a predator, that sea cucumber can literally throw up its own guts, eviscerate. Here are the guts, right? Don't you feel like that? I'm just going to give it everything I've got and change, okay? And that predator will either be scared off or quite possibly eat the guts of the sea cucumber, Okay, also possible, but this is the most amazing thing. That sea cucumber can regrow its own guts. Okay, it's related to a sea star. Sea stars can regrow its arm. That sea cucumber can regrow its own guts. Okay, so if that animal can make it through change, not just surviving, but to totally thrive, when you face that change as a leader, digging into that resilience muscle, you can too live to see another day, not just surviving, but thriving. So I'm telling you, I want to see everybody like, like you can cut it out of my book if you want to, you could print off a sea cucumber from online, but I want you to like put it on your bathroom mirror. I'm going to channel my inner sea cucumber. Yeah. I think puking my guts out does feel like a response to change. Sometimes (laughs) Uh, it's the regrowing part that, that is the inspiration. I think at least for me, Um, you know, I would love to hear from folks. I mean, again, I, I know I've referenced it a couple of times, but it's just been such a big part of our lives, uh, over the last few years is the pandemic and our response to the pandemic. Um, and I know that I've had to double down on my resilient strategies. Uh, and I would love to hear if folks have examples uh, of their resilient strategies that they'd like to share in the chat. I'd love to hear those. Julie, how have you 
sort of built and maintained your resilience? What are some of the strategies that you've used over the last couple of years? Yeah, it's a really good question, Jim, because, you know, resilience often gets conflated with um, Mm self-care, which self-care is a part. I see resilience as an umbrella and self-care is certainly a part of it, but so is setting boundaries. You know, when you have Zoom call after Zoom call after Zoom call after Zoom call, you cannot do that. You know, how are you building in 15 minutes in between? You teach people how to treat you, right? So you are setting your own boundaries. So people, A, know how to respect that, but then B, how to set boundaries for themselves. So I've had to do that. Um, I've had to also dial in and really take stock over, okay, hang on. You know, (laughs) quite honestly, it was, let me institute a, a tea ritual at night and let me institute reading in the morning. Somehow I lost that time where I just read and learn from my own personal growth. And now that half an hour in the morning is the mo- my most favorite time. And I read everything from leadership to, to animal stuff, to, you know, essentialism, how to, how to reorganize. And that's helpful to me. I think sometimes when people hear resilience, they think of it like toughness, like what is it that I can endure? Mm-hmm. But I think resilience is more about about recovery as much as it is Mm. about survival. And um, so I think restorative things have always been really important to me. So like a a mindfulness practice, uh, being out in the outdoors, spending time with my family, doing things where I just unplug. You don't have to be 100% all the time, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. just because you're not thinking about your job 100% of the time doesn't mean you're not committed, doesn't mean you're not there for the mission. (laughs) <laughs> well, and then let me throw you one in there, right? Like you cannot be hundred percent all the time, right. right? Like that's, that's what animals in nature and wildlife and wild places teach us. Like no animal can be on all the time. And we somehow think we can, and you cannot outsmart nature. I'm seeing a lot of resilience, uh, strategies in the chat. Um, you know, we've got someone who said just basically taking it one day at a time when they feel overwhelmed. I, I think that's, that's fantastic. A lot of self-care suggestions, yoga, meditation, uh, therapy is a, is a great option. Um, you know, and, and so I think that, you know, people have really had to double down on resilience. Uh, mm-hmm. and I think that that's, it just seems like it's such a critical part of this process. Mm-hmm. Yep. Nature deals with change all the time, just like we do. And so if they can do resilience, we can too. Yeah. Well, Julie, there's so much in this book. Uh, and so I, I just love to ask you a whole mess of questions. Uh, how's that sound? <laughs> okay. I'm ready. I, yeah. I love that. I have no idea what you're going to ask me. Go <laughs> <laughs> and if, if folks, if you have, if you have questions that you'd like to ask Julie, please do put those in the chat and we'll work those in as well. Um, I just, I want to, I want to talk about change in general, right? So change is, you know, that they say it's the only constant in life, right? That there is change and, and, um, Sometimes it feels like change is just, it's so constant that there is no other side, but you've Mm -hmm. talked about seeing the finish line and how important that is. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think that it is true that change is the only constant and then change is always happening to us. But I talk about leading change and getting out in front of it. Like change management is the weirdest discipline to me because yeah, you have to manage change, but do you really want to manage it or do you want to lead it? I would advocate you want to lead it Mm -hmm. and to effectively lead change and to get your head around it and your team's head around it. You have to set boundaries. You have to set limits. You have to set phases and they will be arbitrary. If you are leading a strategic planning process and owe a strategic plan to your board or to your owners at a certain point, okay, you've got an end in mind, but usually your change process is, well, I want to institute something. Okay. Pick a deadline. You have to pick a deadline because how else are you going to assess, know how far you've come? That's why you've got to know where you started and how else is your team going to be able to celebrate your process and your progress because you've set time bound parameters. Otherwise it's going to get away from you and you're just going to feel like a big old mush. Yeah. (laughs) You know, that, that, that's a great, it really connects well to a question that, that came in from uh, Chris Patron. It, what, are, what are the best ways to evaluate your leadership? You're, you're trying to become a better leader. How do you understand whether you're making progress or not? 
Oh, that's a really good question. I really love doing a personal SWOT analysis first. We use um, looking at your strengths internally, your weaknesses internally, your opportunities and your threats externally. We do that a lot when we do team processes, strategic planning, et cetera. But I think it's a wonderful tool to use individually. And because it allows you to make quantitative marks on what is normally qualitative. Right. So I would start there. And then the second thing is I would break leadership down into digestible chunks. So if you want to start with what I have done, if that makes it easier for you, change team work and resilience. But otherwise, leadership is just way too broad. It's like saying, I want to get healthy. Okay, yeah. Well, do I want to lose weight? Do I want to sleep more? Do I want to you know, lower right. my heart rate? I mean, there's like a lot of things. So personal SWOT analysis, pick digestible components, and then you'll be able to break it down into um, achievable nuggets. Yeah. How do you get feedback from the folks that you're leading about your leadership? Because, mm -hmm. you know, there's that, you know, there's the boss factor, right? Like, can you really tell <laughs> your boss what you think? And, and so, so how yeah. do you get honest feedback from the folks that you're leading? Yeah. You know, it's a really good point. I mean, if you're in an organization and you have colleagues that you trust, um, you can ask them to help um, with that. Um, of course, you can use folks from the external to your company. But honestly, I think you've got to start with the, the transparency and model that first. Mm -hmm. So have you ever sat down with your team, um, for example, right now in the month of January and say, hey, let's be really honest about and it's I get it. There's the boss factor. I totally respect what you're saying. Yeah. But let's be honest about we want to achieve these goals first quarter. Here's what I'm bringing to the table. I feel overwhelmed by COVID. I'm a little bit stressed that it's not over with. And I think that that is showing up in my work um, because I don't think I'm answering emails on time or I think I'm being short with y'all. And I don't think I'm being really upfront with the communication. That's what I'm bringing to the table. And I'm open to what you're thinking. And now they may not say directly yes or no, because that might be right, threatening, right. but they may say, ah, okay, so let me be revealing and honest about what I think I'm struggling with. And so if you're starting to model that culture of um, transparency and honesty, I think that's going to help. I think transparency and honesty is, is so important. I think what you're also getting at vulnerability, right? Like you're, mm -hmm. you're showing it's okay to be vulnerable at work. And, and uh, if we want our teams to go through growth processes, they have to be vulnerable because that's, that's part of growth. Um, I, I think that's, uh, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And, and I think that, you know, as much as leadership to me comes down to two things, it comes down to leading change and making decisions. That is it. Honestly, if you want to really boil it down because you got to lead change and then you have to make a decision. Someone has to make a decision. Is it always going to be right? No, but nature abhors a vacuum leader uh, organizations abhor an, a lack of decisions. So if you're being vulnerable about your decisions, I just got to make the best one I can today. And people will come alongside you. Okay, like they're trying their best. Yeah, so you see another question here that's come in, thinking about uh, trying to lead that change and create the change, creating personal goals that are stretch goals. And you as a leader, at, I mean, we have to be honest, as leaders, we don't do anything by ourselves. Mm -hmm. Like every, when we make decisions, we try to drive change. It's about that team, right? That entire middle section of the book is about the team. So how do you deal with sort of, pushback or conflict that comes around when when your goals uh, result in, in more work and, and stress for other people? <laughs> oh, I'm laughing out of solidarity and familiarity <laughs> and the fact that I just had this conversation with leaders yesterday was awesome. So I'll say two things. Number one, you've got to be really clear with yourself and your team and your leaders that you are after consensus, not agreement. Mm -hmm. And if people understand that from the beginning, that you are going to source opinions, source input, of course, those people that work for you are closer to the process than you are. So you need to source them. But at the end of the day, if you're going to make a decision, you're after consensus, which means people are on board or at least aware of the direction. It does not mean they always agree. That's uncomfortable, but safe. OK, so that's the first thing. And the second thing I would say is your personal goals, if you are being um, straightforward and letting people know and then they there's going to be conflict. OK, um, but if you are then asking, well, what are your personal goals and how do you align with this? Now you've opened up the conversation in a new way and then you can address that conflict head on, knowing that you're after consensus, but knowing you're also after forward progress. Right, and right. they are after the, the that as well. So when you're keeping that big picture, that's where the sea turtle comes in, that purpose in mind. Um, it helps keep moving things forward. 
Yeah, and being clear about that process, right? So, so that people understand how decisions are made. It doesn't become a black box. You know, yeah. And Julie, in in all throughout the book, you talk about uh, trusting your gut, being an instinctual leader, leading the way you were born to lead. And for some people, that's going to just resonate like crazy. And for other people, they've probably been told that. Maybe they, they don't have what it takes to be a leader, or maybe they just haven't heard, maybe no one's ever told them that they're a good leader. And so when you think about it from a, a instinctual perspective, does it, could it lead to people feeling like, well, maybe that's just not what I was born to do? Yeah, you know, it's a good question. I think that's why I wanted to write this book um, from the time I was little, because I was the kid that was super shy. I am sure I was not the kid that was told you're going to be that leader out in front one day. Cause I was the kid who was, you know, hiding off stage and wasn't ready to come on. I did not display what that time were the, the typical leadership skills. Right. Um, but as I got older, I started to realize two things. I started to realize that I brought something to the table that other people didn't because I was more reflective because I could stop and listen better because I found my voice eventually. And then, then got louder. And then I realized, okay, now I need to listen more because I'm now I'm talking over the people that were more like me. So I recognize I had something unique to bring to the table. And I had a lot of people that believed in me along the way. And a lot of people that said no along the way, which helped me. Um, and then the other thing is I, I recognize that there are changes that have to be made in the world that need leaders to do it. And we are all able to impact the world in our own unique way. And, and you are a totally different leader than I am. That's why we complement each other so well. We, we really complement each other well because you're in Seattle and I'm in Florida. So we have the whole country in between us and we can impact things. But I'm serious. Like when you and I work together on projects, I think we're formidable because you pick up things that I don't and vice versa. And you can say things differently than I can, usually in much fewer words. <laughs> because And that's a good thing. And so that's what like... Trust your gut. I mean, again, make that decision. It might be wrong. Doesn't mean your gut's wrong. It means that you're where you're supposed to be. And if you lean into that, you you cannot go wrong in the path that you're going along. Oh, now you're on mute. I was muting because I was coughing. <laughs> uh, you know, trust your gut doesn't also doesn't just mean like, you know, do whatever you think, just pop, first thing pops in your head, right? I mean, <laughs> your, your gut is, is um, influenced by your experience, your knowledge, uh, your mentors. Like, how do you build a better gut? Yeah, <laughs> um, you continue. So, so in the book, I've got this pyramid, right? And the bottom level is knowledge. That means you have to, and it's the broadest level on purpose. You have to continue to increase your knowledge. That's why I'm so thankful that everybody's here today because leadership skills continue to evolve. We are always able to learn more leadership skills because I'm totally different person just in my life journey, my career journey, my family journey, everything that I was five years ago. So if you're continuing to learn and being um, vulnerable, showing up like, okay, yeah, I've been around the block, but I can still learn. It's just like, well, I know you and I've talked about CEOs that we know that who've Mm -hmm taking themselves to week-long leadership retreats. Like how amazing yeah. is that? that? That CEOs at that point, um, Indra Nui, I quote her in the book. She was a former CEO of PepsiCo. I mean, she said, just because you are a CEO doesn't mean you have landed. You must always continue to increase your learning and the way you approach the organization. I've never forgotten that. And that's what she said. She's on the board of directors of Amazon. So continuing to seek out knowledge, putting that to play is what builds experience, but the very top of that triangle is where the wisdom comes in. So you're getting knowledge from other people, you're going through it yourself as experience, but that wisdom is really what your gut's all about. And really you're right, like (laughs) don't always go with your first instinct, but um, just because even, you know, I was here at Moat before you were, well, just because I did something a certain way and you were here after me in tenure doesn't mean you should do it the same way just because I did. Mm -hmm. And so even if we'd have a conversation about it, uh, so it's, taking the pulse, right? Taking other yeah, people's yeah. opinions, reading that academic article, and then making your decision because you're the one. <laughs> if you got to stand up and take responsibility. You got to be the one making decision. Not Jim in Seattle, not my mentor in Miami of Ohio, and certainly not the book I read yesterday. Yeah. So I got a couple of good questions from the chat I want to bring in. What if you are put into a leadership position and you've always been a good second in command? 
And mm. so you've participated in decision making, but now it's you out front. How do you make that transition effectively? Mm, I love this question because I have always loved being second in command in my career. I've always loved having a really strong leader and then me being a really good second. I loved that. And then when I had that opportunity to be that person, I felt the same way. Um, so I would I would say is recognize the trust that these folks have in you to give you that opportunity. You earned it, but they've also um, given you this platform. So lean into the uniqueness that you are bringing to that. Don't shy away from that. And then um, lean into that fearlessness capacity that I know you have and try something new. Do it differently than you would have because you're second in command because you're not second in command anymore. And so you've got to lean into that boldness a little more. And I encourage you the next time you, this is going to sound counterintuitive, but go with me for a second. The next time you got a decision to make and you feel like, oh, I should do this. Second, check your gut and be like, but could I do this? Because could I get out front of it a little broader? And that's going to help you step into that role, if you will, or that feeling, because you are that top person right now. Yeah, I think I, I love that you're thinking about, like, you don't want to be the exact same leader, or try to copy a great leader or, or your great mentors, because I can't remember, it was a, I think it was actually a Toyota executive said that you don't, you don't become great by copying greatness. But you have mm-hmm. to be your own leader. And if you try to be the same leader that that preceded you, everyone will just continue to compare, right? You'll always seem like not quite the same. Yeah, right. I mean, when there's a new quarterback on the football team, they can't do it exactly the way the other quarterback did. I mean, everybody's different on the team. I'm, I'm pulling up this quote here. Yeah, this is a quote that I love um, by George Washington Carver. Start where you are with what you have. Make something of it and never be satisfied. Mm. Nice. All right. Another question. Um, can you share some ways to incorporate vulnerability into leadership? Cause it's, it's not, it's easier said than done. And I, I, I a hundred percent know where that's coming from. Cause you know, it, when you're standing in a leadership role, you sometimes like, it reminds me sometimes of parents at an aquarium, right? Like parents <laughs> at an aquarium will answer any question that's posed to them by their kids where they know that whether they know the answer or not. Right. And just make stuff up. And so, when you're in that leadership position, sometimes you, it's like, you need to be sort of invincible. So how can you also be, you know, vulnerable at the same time? What are some, do you have any practical strategies you can share? Yeah, I love that because I'm thinking about my first job at Shed Aquarium and I'm standing in front of the beluga tank and this family walks up and the, and the, and the dad (laughs) in this case is saying, oh, it's a manatee. And I'm like, well, not, but but I couldn't show the dad up in front of the family. I just couldn't. So I had to think about how I could interact differently. And so that's the analogy is, is when you're thinking about how to show vulnerability in work, I want you to remember that what feels super vulnerable to you mm-hmm. is not always as vulnerable as it seems to other people. Yeah. Okay. So, so here's my really practical example. Before the pandemic, I mean, how many of us were like, I have a meeting at three o'clock, but really it was, I have to pick up my kids from school or I have to go to the mm. dentist or I have to do whatever. And then all of a sudden with this pandemic, kids are crashing Zoom and dogs are crashing Zoom. And all of a sudden we're all like, we're vulnerable. Okay, well, we were the exact same people before. We just didn't want to say we have a personal life because of lots of work pressures. I respect that. But as you take baby steps, but as you reveal more of who you really are, you are giving permission for the people around you to also reveal who they are and start with the things that don't feel terribly unsafe to you, but recognize that vulnerability will create a culture around you that's going to foster change. It's going to foster change um, because vulnerability is, is, a, is a skill. That's what I will say. It's an essential skill. You can continue to learn how to be vulnerable. You can write it down. Here's my goal for January. For January, I'm going to just admit that I'm tired and I have to mm-hmm. just get off this meeting early. If that's all you do in January, then do that. And then in February, I'm going to show I'm vulnerable by admitting that I'm just, this is just really hard right now. And I don't feel like I'm going to meet my goals and I need some help. You're going to ask for help. That's right. all I'm going to do in February. Yeah. I mean, as a leader, you have to model what you expect for your staff. You can't say, Hey, look, I know I'm going to be answering emails at 11 o'clock, but I don't expect any of you to be looking at your emails at 11 o'clock. I mean, if, if, if people see their lead, the, the leader doing it, they also, they'll feel that tacit responsibility to behave similarly. So yeah, yeah. modeling seems so important. 
Yeah. You know, we have this cat at home. I, I know my kids are online. So I'm like, Hey kids, <laughs> <laughs> oh, we have this cat at home and we laugh all the time because she was a stray and um, we got her from the local cat shelter when she was one years old. But sh- this cat, you would never know she's a stray because she just lays around the house like, like this. And we're like, how did you ever survive in the wild? Because you know, like this is your, oh, I'm sorry, I messed up the camera now. How did, this is your like super vulnerable spot, right? Like right, if a predator right. is gonna attack you, it's gonna eat your belly. And this cat just allows herself to be, and I love that, that's my model for vulnerabilities. I'm watching this cat, <laughs> like she went from living in the literal wild to like living in this house and gaining twice her body weight in a, body weight in a month. And she just leaned into the situation and, and read the room really and was like, okay, I'm feeling safe. She doesn't always feel comfortable. You know, when we clean the house and turn the vacuum cleaner on, she's not comfortable, (laughs) but she feels safe. That's what vulnerability is safe, but not comfortable. That's great. So, and we're, as we're, we're nearing towards the top of the hour, I know you wanted to talk about intention setting as part of the, this process. Yeah, I want to bring it home for everybody. I mean, we're at the beginning of 2022 we and you have been so awesome with your interactivity in, in the chat. We love it. And I would love for you now to write in one intention based on the change that you have told us that you want to lead based on the resiliency strategies you need in order to lead this change. What's one intention that you can take away from our time here together that you could put into action in 2022? All right. So you all put in a ton of changes into the chat. So I'd love to hear some intentions. How are you going to take that forward? And uh, Julie, I guess if if I'm going to n- name an intention for myself, I think it's to be very meta about the bringing new staff into our group. Uh, mm. Spend a lot of time talking about, we got new people coming in. This is going to have an influence on our culture. How do we want to welcome them? How do we want them to to be a part of our, our, our team. So I think, I think having those conversations at a meta level, uh, will take some of the edge off for me that the, the nervousness about that change process. Yeah. I love that Jim. And, and, and knowing you as well as I do, I know that there'll be an intentional vulnerability around that. And I think that's like, that's somewhat what you're saying too, like in between the lines, if you will, because I think that's been part of our conversation and, and that just goes along with my intention, which is to, um, as much as I, I, I espouse it and, and to believe wholeheartedly that we bring our unique self and authentic self, I need to continue to lean into that because that's sometimes yeah. hard. Um, but that's my intention. So I'm seeing a lot of really good intention setting in the chat. Practice grace with uh, Mm -hmm. our others and yourself. Amen to that. Uh, Open with my ideas. Stay positive, but real. I think that's good because I think there's, there is such a thing as toxic positivity, right? So people need you to be real, especially when you're, when you're living this, when you live in this world, Uh, trust the team, Uh, do a personal SWOT analysis. Love that from Terry. Um, going to actively seek feedback from my students and adapt my classes to their interests. Love that too. Ton of really good intention setting here. Really nice stuff. I'm so proud of everybody. It's really, um, it's really vulnerable to put intentions yeah. into the chat in a Zoom. So, you know, we appreciate you sharing with us and um, sharing with, that, with each other. And uh, I just, way to model the change and the vulnerability and the resilience that you want to bring into this year. All right, Julie, on our, on our way out here, um, any closing thoughts? What, what, what would you want to leave folks with when they're thinking about, um, thinking about being the leader that they were, they were born to be? Yeah. I want to encourage everybody to look at wildlife and wild places as a leadership, uh, Mecca right? We, we talk about walking outside and taking a breath for resilience, do that. But I want you to walk outside and ask questions, just like John talked about in the video, the sunset's never the same. Mm-hmm. Um, that's going to remind you that your leadership journey is never the same. And just like that next sunset is beautiful and you look forward to it, even if it's obscured by clouds and you can't see it, you still walk outside to see it. That's what leadership feels like, even though it's like, Oh, I don't know. It's still beautiful the next day. So, so uh, it, I don't mean that to sound as cheesy as it feels. So when I say it on Zoom, but I wholeheartedly believe in it, um, that nature nature is is just always there for us. And so I'm so thankful that I can always walk outside and learn more about leadership. And I encourage you to do the same. Love it. Thank you so much, Julie. Thank you for your, your thoughts and, and wisdom today. Thank you for this book. 
<laughs> and thanks for allowing me to be part of this event today. And and um, and I'll I'll turn it back over to Jason to bring us home. Thank you so much. I appreciate you, Julie and Jim. A uh, fantastic job. And I uh, hope everyone uh, learned a little bit about uh, wisdom from wildlife today. And uh, what I want to do now is just tell you about a couple more opportunities that are coming down the pike here uh, from Moat Marine Laboratory and Aquarium. And start off, you can continue this lifelong learning adventure with us on Monday nights. We have our special lecture series coming up this Monday at 6 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, go to moat.org to find out the link for it. We're going to be talking about our coral science with Dr. Muller and Dr. Koch, and there's a whole month of programming coming at you. And if you want an even longer adventure, we have a program here called Endless Oceans. It's a lifelong learning series that's going to kick off again in late March. Again, go to moat.org to find all about it. Now, let's say you're a little bit younger at heart. Maybe you want to join us for a free tour, virtual tour of our shark zone. That'll be coming up on January 31st at 9 a.m., you can join me up on top of the shark habitat. I'll bring our portable distance learning kit and we'll get up close and personal with the sharks and uh, learn a little bit about their biology, husbandry and training. And as I said, if you're young at heart, I hope you can join us for another free sea show program. We're gonna be celebrating the 100 year anniversary of Dr. Eugenie Clark's birth. Dr. Clark was the founder of Moat Marine Laboratory. We're gonna read this fantastic storybook together called Swimming with the Sharks. That's sponsored by Cisco and the Center for Interactive Learning and Collaboration. That's coming up on her birthday on May 4th, uh, 2022 at one o'clock PM. Again, go to moat.org uh, to find out more about that. And to wrap this program up, thanks again, Jim and Julie. I wanted to hand it over to Julie and Dr. Crosby, our CEO and president, and they're gonna share a little bit of the wisdom that they have uh, about wildlife. Dr. Crosby, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, as you know, I started my career here mm -hmm. at the um, aquarium and the laboratory back in 1994 before these buildings were even connected. So just coming back here has been so nostalgic. And now to be here and have a conversation with you about leadership and wildlife and wild places, it's just, well, it's just a dream come true, <laughs> quite honestly. Well, it's, it's fantastic to have you come back and Look where you've gone uh, <laughs> with where you came from at Moat, all the experiences you've had mm -hmm. here, and how that's allowed you to broaden out and do so many impactful things in, in your career as well. So. Oh, well, thank you. That means a lot. And, you know, a lot of people, when they ask me about Moat, I tell them that for me, it was the first time that I understood science come alive mm -hmm. because I have a whole degree in science from college, but that was more about answers at that point. And then I came here and I realized that questions are really the foundation of science. And that's when I started to realize the living and breathing nature of it. And that's when all the leadership stuff started connected for me as well. Because as I was growing as a leader, I was thinking, well, there's just not one way to do science and there's just not one way to lead. And so how, how do you see that um, in your work as a leader of this organization, but also the leaders that you see coming up the, the chain? I think most is um, a wonderful example of diverse leadership yeah. at all levels and new experiences. Um, whether it's in the aquarium, whether it's in education, whether it's in the research um, side of the world. We've got so many leaders at different stages of their career and in different phases of the entire enterprise that all come together um, for a shared, to achieve a shared vision, a shared uh, you can learn so much about leadership and the different leadership models uh, from observations of nature mm -hmm. um, because nature is quite diverse, mm -hmm. diverse species, diverse communities that are all successful with slightly different strategies depending on their circumstances. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I love how you're um, stitching that together because I would advocate that nature is stable, is healthy, mm -hmm with that diversity. It is. And so, for example, coral reefs and most mm -hmm. wonderful research in that ecosystem, you take away the coral, which people don't even realize is alive many times, mm -hmm. and everything disappears mm -hmm. in that. Yeah, I think coral reefs are a beautiful example. Um, when you look at a coral reef environment, it really is a parallel for a successful, balanced, 
corporation, institution, or society as a whole, and you think about all those different organisms, coral cannot exist by itself. It has to have that symbiotic relationship with a little plant, a little zooxanthellae that lives inside of it. They depend on each other, mm -hmm. but they also depend on the organisms outside of the coral polyp, the coral skeleton, the fish, the invertebrates, mm -hmm. that help to graze and keep down macroalgae, mm -hmm. that keep the whole system in balance. And I think that is a great example of species diversity working together in a community mm -hmm. to make that community resilient, uh, make it able to withstand challenges that it faces and to thrive in the long term and grow. And that's what we hope our companies, our institutions, and our communities um, will also be. Um, so it's a good example. It's a very good example. Where would you see the leadership legacy of Moat continue, whether mm -hmm. as a scientific community, whether as just a leadership development nurturing mm -hmm. place as, as I see it as well? I mean, Five years from now, if we were having this conversation, what would you love to tell me about? That five years from now, I hope and I expect that Moat will be in a even greater level of having impact mm -hmm. for conservation and sustainable use of our marine resources based on science, mm -hmm. and that we will have a significantly greater impact in enhancing the level of ocean literacy amongst mm -hmm. the broader public at large and ensuring that every child in this entire region has the ability to have a hands-on and experiential learning opportunity mm. in marine STEM related fields. Um, and I'm convinced that we will be there within five years mm. um, and that we will continue to grow. We will continue to have the impact um, because we do have the support of the community and we have such passionate people here, like yourself, still <laughs> passionate about the mission of Moat yeah. and what brought you here yeah. in the first place. So yeah. Jeannie has had a lasting.